Uh, several things right after the service, I'd like to invite all the boys and girls to go to the youth room for special Bible studies with Mrs. Santos and Elder Gibran and uh, the angels and uh, Shannon. So please make sure you plan to come, go there. Also wanted to make sure that, uh, number two, be part of a study group. Be part of a small group, a care group. It doesn't matter what uh, time or date in the week they meet. Just be part of it. This is crucial for your growth and preparation for the soon coming of Jesus. So make sure you get involved. We're going to try to launch more groups as we have more leaders who are willing to host or, or be willing to be leaders. Again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a big group. That's why we call it a small care group. We're talking about from, from 3 to 5 to at least 10 to 11. Be willing to host. It's very important. And finally, our leadership team meeting right after lunch today. Ladies and gentlemen, I've shared just briefly several weeks ago what happened when, when the Pope and Kenneth Copeland, one of the leaders for the Pentecostal charismatic group, made a pact, made a covenant to unite. Now, to many of us, it just went by our heads. Ooh, what was that? Just another news. Ladies and gentlemen, how important is July 4th, 1776? Is that day very important for this country? Yes, yes or no? Yes. It is very important. How important is the date, 18, October 22, 1844, for this church prophetic movement? Is this important? Amen. What you just, what happened just several weeks ago is just as huge as that event that's taken place. Now, if you have no idea what's taking place, you need to open up the book of Revelation. You need to say, Lord, what do I need to do to prepare for that? Because, ladies and gentlemen, these events are taking place not just as a historical event. It's to usher in the soon coming of Jesus. Amen. And then, just a few days ago, one of our leaders met with the Pope again. And here, the, the talks are friends. It seems like there's... According to Revelation 13, according to Revelation 16, all of these are coming to the forefront. And here we've been talking about it. We've been preaching about this for many decades. And now that it's right before our eyes, it's happening. The rest of the people are just asleep. Oh, it's just a new, I saw it in CNN. Ladies and gentlemen, you should be excited already because here it is. This is the, what we were talking about. Jesus is coming soon. Major signs of the times. And why we come to church is not just so we can just be able to come together and fellowship. It is so that the people of God can prepare as many people for the soon coming of Jesus. Amen? This is what it's all about. Prophecy gives us your time frame when all of these are coming together. And so somehow if you miss a train, get, in, get on the train, Right? Get in there and see what's it all about. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an exciting time. I wanted to let you know because, because we've been studying about this, we've been preaching about it and teaching about it. I said, Lord, it's right here. We're seeing it right before our very eyes. You are alive seeing this happening. It is a sign of the soon coming of Jesus. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we begin our service in the word, we invite your Holy Spirit and your presence to be with us. Oh, Father, will you please speak through this weak vessel? I'm just a weak instrument, but I pray, please use me as your instrument to preach with boldness, with clarity, and yet with simplicity. Lord, I pray, bring conviction upon your people that they will hear your voice and not mine. Let your words be my words, your thoughts be my thoughts. I pray, oh, Father, Bind the enemy, cast him out. Let him not be able to interfere or interrupt what will be taking place in the next several minutes. Amen. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hold up your Bibles with me. Say it together. Hold it up. Up high. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you believe it? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our message is entitled today, Living Deeply, Agonizing in Prayer, Part 1. Agonizing in Prayer, Part 1. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is the time that the word of God is still telling us that everyone is going through a ceiling. The ceiling is taking place right now, and God is trying to prepare his people for his soon coming. Yet either we receive the seal of God or we miss out receiving the seal of God and receive the other mark that we don't want called the mark of the beast. Yet it is here we are told, as we've been talking about for the past several weeks, the past several months, that there's a sealing instrument, there's a seal, and we talked about the sealer. Who is the sealer? The Holy Spirit. What is the sealing instrument? It is the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God, as you study the Word of God, it is the Word that seals and prepares and transforms you and me. And as you study the Word of God, the biblical truths come out. And there, from all the truths, you'll see the law of God standing right in the front and center. And there, when you look closer to the law of God, right in the very heart is the Sabbath itself. And so, here you see why God is saying, the seal itself is not the Sabbath. The seal itself is the character of Christ reflected in the believers, the committed Christians. Amen? Amen. And so don't look at it as just an external Sabbath as many people have taught before. It is actually the character of Christ, the character of Christ in every committed believer. Ladies and gentlemen, the sealing process is over when God sees his people are fully able to reflect the character of Christ. Or when a person dies. Now, for the past several weeks, since March 8, this has dominated the news. Flight MH370, the Malaysian Airlines, never got to their destination. I've been glued to the television, CNN, or wherever I can get here information about this. Families are crying out, crying out, where are my family? Where are my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife? Where are they? Why can't you produce evidence? They're searching for three weeks and still no tangible evidence. They said perhaps it crashed here. Perhaps it was, it was hijacked and taken to some mysterious place. Can you imagine the faces? When you look at the faces of these people, you can see they're crying out of agony because they lost their loved one. Here it is. You just can't imagine the tragedy, the pain in their hearts when they when they know they, they will never see their family member again. And then just a few days ago in also Washington or the uh, Arlington, Washington, the mudslide had taken place. People were just living and taking, doing their normal thing early in the morning, whether it was having breakfast, reading the newspaper, and all of a sudden they were buried alive. They, many of them, according to this point, are fearing that maybe over a hundred people would have been buried there. The f- agony in the faces of the people that are, are you can see right here, is imag- can you imagine the pain? The pain that's going through them. Today, my friends, our message will relate to the word agony. Today will be a new beginning in your life. It's called part one because part two is when you apply the principles what you're going to be hearing today. It is one of the most important sermons I've ever preached besides preaching about Jesus Christ for your salvation. I'm excited to talk about agonizing in prayer. Do you know why? Because the Bible points out clearly that when God's people pray earnestly and agonize alone corporately as a group, God listens and answers. Amen? Amen. Oh, we can do a better amen than that. Amen? amen? The Red Sea was parted. The lion's mouths were shut. The sun stood still. The sick were made well again. The dead were made to live again. The captives were set free. The blinds were made to see. The five loaves and the two fish were multiplied to feed thousands. Hearts were softened and the skies were made to rain. There's a common denominator in all these prayers. And that is agonizing prayer. You know, the dictionary defines agonize basically this, to suffer extreme pain or anguish, to be in agony. Number two, to put forth great effort of any kind. And number three, to distress with extreme pain or torture. You say, Pastor, 
Why should we act in in prayer? What does it do? What are some of the key Bible passages that brings light to all of this? Another term, by the way, for agonizing prayer is wholehearted prayer or intercessory prayer. You know the difference between the two? Is intercessory prayer is a type of prayer, whereas agonizing in prayer is the way or how you pray. Intercessory prayer is you're praying for someone's behalf who don't know, who do not know how to pray. So you said, Lord, will you please be with Kim? She doesn't know how to pray. She's, she doesn't know she's going She's making a poor choice in our life. Please help her. You're interceding on our behalf. But agonizing in prayer, my friends, it is when you're pouring out all of yourself, your heart and everything until it drains the humanity in, in you and it connects you to the divine. You see, you struggle with Christ and you realize you're holding on to the divine almighty and until you're in the presence of God and you don't want to let him go without blessing you, without changing you, without answering your prayers. Amen. This is the difference. Here's the, passage from, here's the passage from Reflecting Christ. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. How few have ever had their souls, notice the word, drawn out after God with intensity. Notice the word intensity of desire. Until what? Every power is on the stretch. This is what agonizing prayer is about. When waves of despair which no language can express sweep over the suppliant, how few cling with unyielding faith to the promise of God. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, you see here what this is talking about. This is talking about a powerful way how we need to be praying. You struggle, my friends. I want you to know when you, when you struggle in prayer, when you agonize in prayer, it is like Daniel who agonized to God for 21 days. 21 days. He, for, he, he, he fasted and said, Lord, I'm going to keep on praying until you answer this. He poured out everything that he could pour out to God. And you know what happened after 21 days? Jesus appeared before him. And then the angel Gabriel was even sent to let G Daniel know that his prayer was answered on the very first day. Amen. Friends, when you agonize in prayer, people pray this way. Lives are changed. Many of you are not aware that you you can make a difference in the lives of people. And I'm not talking about just a small difference. I'm talking about changing the lives of people for eternity. A quantum difference in a colloquial term today. You can rock somebody's world. You can shake them upside down, my friends, when you agonize us in prayer. You can influence them for good and change them for eternity. Now, why not influence people that you know that you love for eternity. Amen? Amen? Now, how many of you parents have reminded your kids to practice their, their music lessons? Raise your hands. Amen? How many of you have reminded your kids to, to do their homework? Yes? Only a few of you remind your kids? <laughs> now, isn't it interesting as parents, we take time to remind our children to protect their physical, their mental, their emotional, social, scholastic interests. But when it comes to their spiritual lives, we don't take the time to teach them what is important and vital. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest activity you as a parent can teach your child? Well, first of all, you can pray for them, right? And I'm not talking about just praying for the blessing of the food or just before they go to sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about teaching them to pray effectively, teaching them to pray wholeheartedly, teaching them how to agonize in prayer. And I'm not just talking about a specific group of people here. I'm talking about the whole church here today. Ladies and gentlemen, wrestling with God. How few cling with unyielding faith to the promises of God, right? Right? Today, you will learn what agonizing prayer is about. Because 
It is the key to prayer that brings out the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is the key that brings about the changes that you've never seen before in your lives. Things that you've been praying for for many years, friends, and you want to see God parting Red Seas, it is when you learn how to pray to agonize before God. You know, one thing that we want to see is that we want to see God move things. So now let's turn, our, turn to the Word of God and see the principles of agonizing prayer. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. You have your Bibles? Even though I'm flashing on the screen, I want you to be able to, to map it out, highlight it, and be able to highlight and circle those words. Genesis chapter 32, let's start with verse 1. Genesis chapter 32. Here it reads, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. In verse 2, when Jacob saw them, he said, this is what? God's camp, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Now, friends, Jacob was, just give you a background, Jacob was coming back, af, back home after being gone for 20 years. 20 years, he realized, though, as he was coming back, something was terrible, terribly wrong. You see, his brother Esau heard about him coming home. The brother whom whom he had betrayed. You see, Esau found out about this and he wanted revenge. Esau, the one whom he deceived, the brother whom he lied to and cheated and stole his birthright and took away the blessings that was for Esau. As we continue in our passage, look in verse 6 and 7. It reads, when the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you with 400 men are with him. And this is not a hospitality team here. This is men of war, men that want to kill Jacob, his children, his wives, everything that belonged to jo Jacob. And notice verse 7. Jacob was greatly what? Afraid and distressed. Have you ever been in that situation in your life where you're greatly afraid and distressed? My friends, if you haven't, it's going to come into your life soon, right? It says here, Jacob was greatly distressed. He was scared to death, my friend. He was in serious trouble. You see, he's committed one of the greatest capital offenses you could ever commit. Do you know what that is? To offend a family member. We're told in Scripture that a family member is harder to win because they're not willing to forgive. Esau was fierce. He wanted revenge. He had carried all these years his anger, this bitterness, and he was just waiting for his father to die. And once his father died and mother died, he would say, I'm going to take revenge to my brother. I will kill my brother. Friends, talking about stress, talking about big troubles, talking about agony, Jacob had big troubles, Right? Here we see he was greatly distressed. And here we see, my friends, in the next passage, I want you to see the principles. There are basically several principles in agonizing in prayers. So I want you to be able to jot this down. It's found, in the first one is found in verse 9. Take a look. Then Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, the Lord has said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will what? I will deal well with you. Number one, promise number one, claim God's promises. When you are in trouble, claim God's promises, my friends. Jacob prayed to God and reminded him of his promise. He reminded God of the promise he had made to his father, his grandfather. He was clinging on to the promise that belonged, that God had given to him. Friends, you can claim the promises in the Bible too, right? Because you belong to God. It is yours when you've surrendered your life and your heart to Him. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. So if you have committed your life to God, guess what? The promises you see in the Word, they're all yours. Amen. You can claim them as if they were directly given to you. Amen. Oh, friends, I want you to see the next one. In verse 10, I am not worthy that the least of all the mercies 
and of all the truth which you have shown your servant, for I cross over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Here it is. Here it is, principle number two. You will see here, my friends, that pray in humility. He's Pray in humility. Basically, he, Jacob is stating in humility that he is not worthy. Jacob comes to God with great humility, basically saying, Lord, I do not deserve the mercies of God because of the life that I've lived for 20 years, a life of deception, a life of lies. I've deceived everybody else, but I haven't deceived God. And usually, my friends, when people are in trouble, guess where they look? Up, oh, right? They look up. By the way, some people look everywhere else but up. <laughs> the first thing you should do is look up when you're in trouble. Hello? Amen? Amen? Friends, are we really worthy to receive the mercies of God? Yes or no? No. Effective praying must be encased in humility while clinging on to God's mercies. You're saying, Lord, I don't deserve your grace and mercy, but you gave it anyways, therefore I am claiming them. Amen? Amen? This is very important. You say, pray in humility. Pray humbly before God. Let's go to the next passage. Number three, principle number three. Thank God for his blessings. Thank God for his blessings. It says, for I cross over this Jordan with my staff and now have become two companies. See, this is why we have this praise section here. This is why we have the opportunity for, for the church body to give praise to God for his many blessings. Are you counting his blessings each day to you? Amen. Or are you just taking it in? Well, I deserve it anyway. Amen. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, count the blessings that God has been, he keeps pouring on you. Don't make the mistake like the children of Israel and assumed everything, took it for granted, right? right. Principle, let's go to the next one. Take a look at the next passage in verse 11. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me with a mother, with the children. Now, principle number four is this. Be specific. Be specific. You see in verse 11, it says, deliver me, I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. Jacob said, deliver me. You need to state this, your, your very specific request. He didn't say, Lord, please help me, amen. No. Lord, you know my problem, amen. Right? Amen. He didn't say that. It wasn't a general prayer. It was a very specific prayer. Lord, please deliver me from the hand of my brother. And he called him by name. Esau, Amen. not John Doe, Amen. right? He called him by name. So you, when you come before God, be specific before God. Amen. Tell him. And then principle number five, tell God your feelings. Amen. Tell God your feelings. Then he opened before God and shared his emotions for I fear him lest he come and attack me and kills my whole family. Lord, I'm scared. Lord, I'm afraid. Friends, when you pray a specific prayer to God, tell him how you feel. Lord, I don't understand this. I'm just frustrated. Lord, I'm just ready to give up. Jacob just didn't say a simple prayer. You see, he was in distress. He was in despair. He realized any hour now his brother will come and kill all of them and there'll be no more legacy. It is when you realize that there's no other way but God's way. No other way but God's way. When you pray that kind of prayer in desperation, you come before the Lord. Tell God your specific request. Be specific, my friends. Open up how you feel about it. Lord, I'm afraid I don't know what's gonna, how this is going to turn out. Please, Lord. I don't know how, how this is going to, to all come together. Tell God your fears. Tell God what's bothering you. Tell God everything, my friends, as you agonize to you in prayer, right? Look in verse 12. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Principle number six, remind God his promises again. 
Remind God of his promises again. Oh, my friends, this is what we need to do. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. If Jacob is basing his, his deliverance from the, pro- from the promises of God, do you know some of the promises of God? Help me out. I will never leave you nor what? Forsake you. Call unto me in the day of trouble and I will what? I will deliver you, right? And glorify me. Now, let me ask you this one. Can we claim this promise? You sure? You better believe it. You better believe. By the way, be sure to know the promise of God. Take time to read the word of God. Take time to study and memorize his promises each day. Because when you're coming before the Lord and said, Lord, I need your help. But you know the promise you give. I don't even remember it, Lord. But you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it weakens your prayer. Amen. When you come before the Lord and you, you, when you have it memorized or you have the word of God, you say, Lord, this is what you said right here. I'm using your word. I'm claiming your promise. He gives power and authority in your prayers before God as you agonize before him, right? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is important. As you open your heart before God, this is crucial. If you expect salvation, you must pray and take time. You cannot be hurried and careless in your prayers. You're pleading to the Lord, Lord, please do something. Please do something. By the way, you know, when I first researched this message, I thought agonizing in prayer was when, when Jacob was physically wrestling with the angel of the Lord. When God showed me, no, 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 it's not that. Go before. That's why I'm sharing with you so far. How many principles? I hope you've been jotting down six principles that can make a huge difference in your life. Six major principles. Take a look. As we continue in the word of God, in verse 22, here's this classic one we know about. And he arose that night. And took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of the Jabbok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. What he did, after he sent his family to a safe camp to sleep, he prayed again. Ladies and gentlemen, principle number seven to agonize before the Lord, you want to take the time when everything is quiet. TV is shut, radio, iPod is shut, turned off. Just listen to the voice of God and agonize with him in prayer. This is going to be very important. You see, Jacob had no idea, had no idea what's going to be taking place. But he wanted to pray. He wanted to talk to God. He wanted to just have an opportunity to pour everything to God. As you see, we're told Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. The place where the river Jabbok was was known and notorious for people being mugged, people being killed because it was a dangerous place. So Jacob thought as he was walking there to to agonize with God that one of Esau's men was there to, to hurt him or to kill him, and so he turned around and wrestled with that man. He grabbed this person, and then he did basically, we're told that they wrestled. They wrestled for hours, right? Now, let me ask you this. Who was he wrestling with? Jacob re- realized he was wrestling. He wasn't just any ordinary person. According to the Word of God, according to some version, you will have the man capitalized. When the word man is capitalized, what does that indicate in the middle of a sentence? It's indicating divinity. He was wrestling with Jesus himself. He was wrestling with God himself. And notice it says here, he was wrestling until the breaking of day. Now let me ask you this, my friends. Let me ask you this. When do you think Jacob set his family to go to sleep? Remember, they didn't have no electricity in that time, right? They only had lanterns and lamps. So when the sun set around 6 p.m., things get pretty dark already, right? There's really not much you can do when things are dark with a few candles or lamps. And so they probably go to bed around 8.30 or 9, right? In 
you know what I'm talking about? So Jacob went out to the river Jabbok. I'm thinking around 9 p.m., 9.30 p.m., and he started praying. And he started wrestling with the angel of the Lord until the breaking of day. When is the breaking of day? When does the dawn usually begin? 5.30-ish, right, or 6 a.m. Can you imagine, my friends, wrestling for seven, eight hours with God, praying with great intensity with God like never prayed before, right? So here it is. If you are fighting for your life, you know your adrenaline kicks in with superhuman strength. I remember one of my elders in Michigan, he, he, unfortunately, he did not have a stable job, so he started working at a 7-Eleven store. You know, dangerous place to work. And Sunday night, one Sunday night, as he was behind the counter, the only person in that 7-Eleven store, some guy came in, you can see it from the surveillance video, came in and pretended he wanted to get uh, a, a little item and grab something out of his sleeve. It was a hammer and hammered him on the head. I could see there was being, I saw the video itself, hammer him there. Fortunately, he was strong enough. He was able to deflect as he got hit. He was able to wrestle with, with, with that man. Now, by the way, that person, you, you know, is huge, my elder. He's, he's like a linebacker, big muscle. He works out. But when this guy was wrestling, was, uh, the one that wanted to rob him was bigger than him. And so they were wrestling. He was fighting for his dear life, trying to get that hammer out. And he was able to put a chop, a, 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 a lock, elbow lock hold, and be able to try to punch that guy back. And finally, the guy was able to run and escape. He, he didn't put stitches on his head, but he was alive. He's telling me that, Pastor, my adrenaline was in, but it was God who saved me from this. You see, my friends, to Jacob, when he was wrestling, he realized, he realized he was in the presence of the Holy One. He realized suddenly his unworthiness, his life of sin just poured over him. One thing that's interesting, my friends, in the Word of God that tells us in the next verse, in verse 24, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Principle number eight, my friends, is this. Pray however long it takes. Pray however long it takes. Don't just say, oh, Lord, I have 10 minutes. You know I'm busy. Then you're going to go watch Jimmy Fallon or other TV shows at night or go into Facebook or so on. That's not agonizing in prayer, my friends. You may have to put that aside and just say, Lord, I'm not going to watch anything. I'm going to pass from all these things so I can focus in praying and agonize with you. Amen? Yes. Pray however long it takes. When Jacob realized this was an ordinary person, he was different. He realized this person had the answer to his problem. Yet it dawned on Jacob that he was wrestling the angel Lord Jesus Christ himself. The presence of the Holy One. All of a sudden, he saw, he saw, he's not going to let him go. He's not letting him go. In fact, here we see in the next passage. Now when he saw that he did not prevail, notice the word capitalized he did not prevail against him, small h. So Jesus did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Think about that. Think about that. Let me ask you this, my friends. Was Jacob actually stronger than Jesus? Well, the Bible says so, right? The Bible said so. It, it, Jacob's hold on Jesus was so strong that Jesus could not get out from that wrestle hold. Remember, my friends, Jesus who spoke the words and the world came to existence. It was this Jesus, my friends, who made the dead to live again. It is this same Jesus, all he had to do was just, just say the words. Things come into existence. Yet, in fact, we are told in the Bible when Jesus, when Jesus 
touched Jacob's hip, instantly Jacob was crippled, right? So we knew that Jesus had the power. Question is, what is it that held Jesus helpless by Jacob? What is that situation where we're told here? Jesus, we know, is more powerful. What is it? You know, as I search through scriptures and I search through patriarchs and prophets, I found the answer. Would you like to know? Yes. Oh, it's time to go. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the only reason Jacob was able to hold Jesus down was through three things, we are told. Humility, repentance, and self-surrender. Pastor, help me translate that. What does it mean? It means when you come before the Lord in humility, you grab God's attention. When you come before the Lord in repentance, you say, Lord, I am nothing. I'm not worthy. I am sinful before your presence. God listens to that. Friends, humility catches God's attention. When, he comes, when we come before God, we need to come with great humility and a humble heart. Somebody ought to say amen, my friends. <laughs> When you do that, when you say, God, I am not worthy to be in your presence. Yeah. And you know what God says? There's my child. What is it, my child? He's listening and tuning in to your prayers. He's listening in. When you come to the Lord in repentance, you need to say, Lord, will you please forgive me? Yeah. Yeah. I am a sinful person. You know, it worries me when somebody says, ooh, I haven't sinned in three days. Right? I'm getting ready for translation. <laughs> My friends, when we come before the Lord, when you come closer and closer to Jesus, you know what happens? We see more and more of our sinfulness. Yeah. Yeah. And that here is the pure Son of God, sinless, perfect, yet He wants to spend time with me. Now, this wrestling is not fighting like this, you know, really hurting each other. It is spending time here. It is here, this is so important, and you see this, my friends. When you pray to the Lord, Lord, please forgive me, He will answer that prayer. He, God gives top priority of all the things He's doing in the entire universe. When you say, Lord, please forgive me, He drops everything else and I'm going to forgive you, Amen. right? He puts you on top of the list. Amen? Yes. It grabs God's attention. He can't go anywhere else because it is his nature to forgive. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, self-surrender. Thirdly, you must come in the attitude of self-surrender. That is to say, Lord, I give this all up to you. I am totally dependent on you. My, your wisdom is my wisdom. Your strength is my strength. Jacob said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, that's the kind of prayer that is needed. If you want God to answer you my prayers, my friend, hold on to him. Right? I will not let you go until you bless me. Oh, my friends, how many of you just pray and said, no, you move on. We said, well, we better move on to life because life is waiting for us. My friends, your life is in God. Real life is when you're spending time in wrestling with the Lord, right? Sometimes we feel that our priorities should be God's priorities. Did you hear me? We can't do that. We can't do that. Because God said, you know what? Some of you are spending all this time doing this and doing that. What if I want you to go the other way? What if I want you to shorten what you're trying to study for, or trying to work up for your career? You're trying to build your world here right now. You know the world is about to end. I'm trying to give you a jump start, a prophetic start where life should be, where you can have life abundantly, full of joy, filled with the Spirit, and yet doing your thing to advance God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. And so this is what God is looking for, my friends. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what God wants to do. You need to hold on to him. If you have problems in your life, if you have problems you're dealing with that seems impossible, decisions you have to make in areas in your life that you need God answers, 
If you have a situation in your family, you have a problem with your son, problem with your daughter, problem with your wife, problem with your husband, problem with a relative, problem with your friend, whatever it is, you, then you desperately need to come before Jesus. Cry, Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. Lord, I will not give up. I will not let you go until you answer this prayer. Amen? Amen. Some of you have been sharing with me, Pastor, I've, I've been doing this now and God answering my prayers. I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then do continue to do that. Do not let go until he touches your hearts, until he brings conviction in your lives. Right? This is what agonizing prayer is all about. Because when we pray and say, Lord, take care of this, amen. Lord, just deal with this, amen. Don't you know how busy I am? I have so many things to do, Lord. And God's saying, my son, my daughter, I want to spend time with you. Give me your problems. What are they? What are they? Right? Principle number nine, don't let go of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Don't let go of Jesus. We're told in the great controversy, the book Great Controversy, we need to learn to wrestle with God in prayer the way Jacob did. This means we need to learn to hang on to God and really pray with everything that we have. Pray like we've never prayed before. Right? right? right. Verse 27 said, and he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And so he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have what? Prevailed. Have prevailed. Have prevailed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exciting news right here. Right? God said, Jesus said, as he's struggling on, and here's Jacob, hang on to Jesus, won't let go. Remember, Jesus could easily snap his finger. Jacob is helpless, right? And hopeless. But it's because of those three things. Humility, repented heart and attitude, self-surrender. Keys right here. Keys, very important. You have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. In other words, what my friends, what I want to share with you is this. What God is saying, principle number 10, wait until he changes you and your character. When you're involved in prayer, you know what it does? It changes you. Yeah. When you agonize in prayer before God, this is what I'm saying about how you need to pray. And I'm not talking about any ordinary prayer, my friends. What I'm sharing with you is usually when I share this in an advanced discipleship uh, session, training session, I want to share this with you because I see marriages falling apart. I see many people are crashing because financially they're in trouble. I see people dealing with health issues, and yet we're still trying to, to, to reach out to God. We just helplessly, when he's saying, here's the tool. Here's how you go about it when you pray if you want God to part the Red Seas for you, right? For Jacob called this place, notice the next one. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is that to you about my name? And he blessed him there. He wanted to know more about Jesus, right? He wanted to know more. Tell me your name, tell me your name. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God, what? Face to face, and my life is preserved. Ladies and gentlemen, agonizing in prayer brings you face to face with Jesus himself. Face to face with him and here we are in the very presence of God and he says you're not destroyed. No one can be in the presence of God in face to face and not be destroyed but let me tell you my friends, agonizing prayer will bring you face to face with Jesus and not be destroyed. Amen? This is what God is trying to do, especially that he is ready to come again. He's trying to say, where are my people? How come they're not coming to me? He's willing to cleanse us, to transform us. That's why when you come to this service here, he doesn't want you to come out the same person, right? right. He wants you to be so transformed, so cleansed, so empowered with the Holy Spirit. You're charged and you're, you're equipped and you say, I'm ready to pray and claim promises for God to advance his kingdom. 
Amen? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, face to face with Jesus. Face to face with him. Principle number 11, continue to know Jesus deeper. Be a God chaser. Be a God chaser. That means chase God when he's in the sanctuary. Chase God when there's a small group. That's why you heard me say it's about being part of a small group. This is one of the reasons why, my friends. Don't just stay at home. You have kids, bring them along in a small group or start a small group. This is so important that you come to the house of God. Remember where two or three are gathered together where? In my name. There am I in the midst of them. Four times a week, this church is getting involved, is involved in intercessor prayer, agonizing in prayer. We're praying for problems in the church, but we need the whole church to be praying. Look at this. I saw how this grace could be obtained. Go to your closet, and there alone plead with God, create in me a clean heart of God, and renew a right spirit within me. Be earnest, be sincere, fervent prayer, what? Avails much. Jacob like wrestle in prayer, agonize. Jesus in the garden sweat great blood, so blood, great drops of blood. You must make an effort. Here's the part: do not leave your closet until what? You feel strong in God. Then watch, and just as long as you watch and pray, you can keep these evil besentments under, and the grace of God can and will what? Appear in you. Hallelujah, right? Yes. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus, Jesus did, gave us the perfect example. Each day he agonized before the Father, not because he needed to be strengthened. He was praying for you. He was praying for his disciples, right? Take a look. He spent whole nights in prayer upon the lonely mountains, not because of his weakness and his necessities, but because he saw, he felt, the weakness of your natures to resist the temptations of the enemy upon the very points where you are now overcome. Yeah. Imagine that Jesus could see you through the centuries and he could, by the way, he wasn't only praying there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is in the most holy place still praying for you. Yeah. He's there sitting on your behalf, right? Yeah. So when you're feeling weak, that's why Jesus, he continues to agonize in prayer. For your behalf. Well, look at this. He knew that you would be indifferent in regard to your dangers. We walk along and we, we even walk in danger. Oh, that's all right. Oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, we, we presumptuously go in there. God said, no, 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 no. There's no time to play with sin, right? He... He would be indifferent in regard to your dangers and would not feel your need of prayer. Someone is praying for you. And yet Jesus is saying, I'm going to give it to my disciples to start praying for others too. Amen. Right? Yes. Are you with me so far? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, take a look. It was on what? Our account that Jesus poured out his prayers to his Father with strong cries and tears. It was to save us from the very pride and love of vanity and pleasure which we now indulge and which crowds out the love of Jesus that those tears were shed. Amen, Amen Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. Thank you, Jesus, right? Thanking Jesus for what he continues to do. Oh, my friends, if you can imagine how Jesus prays for you, agonizes for you each day, each moment. Why? Because... Time is running short. The sealing process is going through, and yet we cannot be of any time in history be indifferent of this. This is why you take hold and say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to agonize with you in prayer. I want you to change me. I'm not going to let go of you. What does it do? It draws out our souls after God. Take a look at this one. Look at what happened. We might have to need, we need the sound on this one too, okay? So let's see if we can hear it. I got this one from 3 ABM. Can we get the sound? Fancy shops, fashion. This is in Italy. Make your empty heart feel full. Well, at least that's what the people who live here would like to think. Italy is also home to more than 60 million people. 
and there is only one Adventist for every 6,900 people. The Adventist Church has had a difficult time growing here. We have a very secularized society, um, and it affects the society and the church also. So it's not easy to come to people that think they don't need God, don't need religion. So we must find strategies to come around all the biases and prejudices that people has, have in their minds. So this is our challenge and we see that some results are appear, appearing here and there. Outside of Milan is the area of Bergamo. Here, a small Seventh-day Adventist church meets each Sabbath. The word small can be used to describe the building that they meet in, not the size of the congregation. Several years ago, the church was small and had no growth. Church leaders decided to try establishing small groups that would use prayer as their outreach to the community. The members organized into small groups that would meet several times a week in members' homes. They would study the Bible for a deeper understanding of Jesus and His love for them. At the same time, they prayed that God would bring people to them so they could share their faith. For several months this continued, and then people from outside the church started attending the small groups. These new arrivals were co-workers and mutual friends who wanted to find a deeper meaning in their lives. Slowly, the small church started to grow. Sabbath school became a time of deep spiritual study and prayer. The small groups would meet in their own Sabbath school groups and then pour over the scriptures together. Then the last 15 minutes of Sabbath school were dedicated to praying in small groups. These groups would pray for God to bring new people to them, people who were also searching for the truth in Jesus. Soon the church had more than doubled in size and had quickly outgrown its small building. Today there are 11 lay leaders at the church and each one is in charge of a small group. There is even talk of starting a church plant in another nearby community to alleviate the crowded church each Sabbath. God has truly answered the prayers of the Bergamo church. In the mission of the church, the gospel has not completed its mission until in the church, between the members, in its totality has accepted the character of Christ. In such a way, we will meet one time per week, after we can meet two times per week. Sometimes people meet three, four, five times per week. We eat together, we enjoy together, we sing together, and we also weep together. And in such a way, the Lord will put people in His church. Your prayerful support of the mission offering helps provide resources to small churches like Bergamo as they strive to reflect the character of Christ and bring the members of their community to Jesus. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine this place was dying until they spent time in prayer. The people prayed seriously and God changed that church. In fact, they stopped, as of the last report, they planted at least three churches. Amen. It grew from 40 to, to several hundred people already. And they said, we need to plant more churches. Oh, my friends, I was praying and asking God, what do I need to be preaching for? And he said, you need to teach this right here agonizing prayer. Our members need to know how to pray, how to agonize before God. Our members need to be able to not only pray at their individually in their homes, but pray collectively as a group. One of the things that, that I've asked the Lord, you know, gone are the days that we're here, here in Nashville first, we just listen to a service and it doesn't touch our hearts. It doesn't move and change us. It doesn't draw us closer to God to pray like we've never prayed before. I said, Lord, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of that. I'm, with things coming together, 
the scenes of the world are coming together. And I said, Lord, you've given me the responsibility to prepare Nashville first. We need to get together to the point where we say, Lord, prepare us. We need to change several things here in Nashville first. The way we pray, how much we pray, how often we pray, and what we do. I'm trying to get away from just the, the basic things. But I want you to be able to spend time and say, Lord, pray to, in a way that we can pray and change us. As I was preparing this message early last, late last night and early this morning and putting it together, the Lord said, you need to do this. Make an appeal. I'm going to invite you to find just one other person in right here. I want you then find that other person. It could be your spouse. Or it could be a friend. But I want you to now just go on your knees and pray. And ask the Lord to do what he needs to do to change in our lives. Pray. Take the moment to pray. I'm not going to say, I'm going to be all out here this morning to pray. I'm just talking about just both of you pray for each other. Now you say, you're saying, well, how do I pray? I've just given you the principles. I've given you the opportunity to pray, but you'll have the opportunity now to take this home. Part two is when you start applying it this afternoon. So would you do this as Lawrence plays the music here? Go on your knees. If you're able to kneel, pray with that person beside you. Just if it's two or three, but don't make it long drawn out. This is something out of the ordinary from our service because God wants to do this. We'll just spend a few minutes. Then we're going to sing a song that will conclude our prayer session. You want to do this? Please pray with someone. Pray with someone. Grab someone who does, doesn't have any individual and pray with them.
Turn your hymnals to 312. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Sing it with me, 312. We will not be able to have time to flash it on the screen. Just grab your hymnal. Jesus, keep me. Join me now in standing as we sing the second stanza. say, Lord, I'm committing everything to you. I'm giving you permission to show me how to be able to apply this principles of agonizing in prayer, that I will apply it in my life. Raise your hands. I'll apply for my family. I, will, I want you to change me like you've never changed before. I want you to prepare me and equip me. Let's, let's sing that one more line here of our stanza, and then we're going to close this time here. Somehow the Holy Spirit said you need to do this. It's out of the ordinary. Let's sing that. If somehow we can still show on the screen. If not, grab your hymnal 312. Near the cross O Lamb of God Peace it seems before me How Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being with us in this service today. Thank you, dear Father, for redirecting us in a way that we could hear your voice. You taught us, dear Father, the principles of agonizing in prayer, and you continue to do that and let us now reciprocate, respond by learning and taking the time to agonize with you in prayer. 
Oh, Father, we want to see changes. We want to see transformations. We want to see futures redirected or plans redirected in the goal that will honor you so that we can fully reflect the character of Jesus. Oh, Father, we need that in this church. We need that in every individual here. You brought them here today because you wanted them, dear Father, to experience this. Oh, Lord, let this church be a praying church. More than ever before, from our service, Sabbath school, through the week, wherever we're doing to spend that time to pray. Oh, Lord, let us now take hold of the arm of Jesus. Do not let you go until you change us. Do not let you go until you bless us, until you answer our prayers. Oh, Father God, thank you now. In your precious holy name, we pray. Amen.